Welcome back to another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I am Gracie Olmsted, Associate Managing Editor at the Federalist. We are coming to you from Hillsdale College's Kirby Center here in Washington, D.C., and today we're talking with Jonathan Coppage, visiting senior fellow with the R Street Institute, where he researches urbanism and the built environment. You can follow him on Twitter at John Coppage. John, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So first, I think this is your first time on the radio hour. So I was wondering if you could just give a quick introduction to yourself and to your interest in urbanism and how you came to be interested in this particular area of policy. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I got my start here at our common alma mater of an institution, the American Conservative. Yes. Um, I'd grown up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, um, but when I got to the American Conservative, I had had an abiding interest in place, in communities, and what makes them strong. And I had, in particular, read this one essay in City, which... um, Ben Dominic edited at the time by Wilfred M. McClay on 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 cities through a conservative um, and even eschatological lens, and was one of the greatest things I'd ever read in interpreting the city and what it means to a conservative. And so, when I got to the American Conservative, I wrote about that, and we were able to secure the project to be able to build that out and continue writing about it. And the remarkable thing when I got there and started writing about conservatism and urbanism, of writing about the relationship between the built environment and civil society, was just how many people came out of the woodwork to show, to say, I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only person who thought about these things. You know, I didn't think conservatives thought about cities or loved cities or enjoyed walkable neighborhoods. And so I've been here in my urbanist closet. <laughs> and it turns out that there are a lot of us around. It's true. There are. Yeah. And I would say, too, I, I don't think I ever fully put into words the passion that I have now for the built environment, for the city, for the towns that make up American civil society, but but when it was fully put forth to me, I think, especially in Why Place Matters, which is a book that Wilfred McClay then went on to help edit and put together, it was fascinating to me how all those days that my family would spend, you know, driving or walking through the most beautiful old neighborhoods in Idaho was this tapping into the love and the nostalgia for well-built spaces. And and I began to wonder, why is that? Why do we have these particular places that are not just healthy and flourishing on an economic level, but culturally and even just visually have this beauty about them that's like a magnet that draws people to them? And I think that's something you've been able to explore quite a bit in your work. It is remarkable when you go to older neighborhoods, basically pre-World War II and walk around, it feels like a humane space. And there's a reason for that. Um, they were crafted with the wisdom that had been passed down and tested over generations. They were shaped around the human scale because you were a human being and you didn't have cars. <laughs> you had your legs. And so everything was built literally to the scale of a human being. Um And so it was good to be outside. It was good to encounter each other. It was good to walk down streets where you could serendipitously come across your neighbor and strike up a conversation or where you could look out and keep an eye on the kids who are running around on the street. And you didn't have to worry about calling the cops because people recognize that if you're in the public space, you're responsible for it. You are a public character, as yes. Jane Jacobs would say. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> and after World War II, we built much more around the automobile um, and built a much more dispersed environment. And after a number of decades, a, gr- a group of people called the New Urbanists started to go to um, Alexandria 
Virginia, your old home. Yes, indeed. And say, this just feels better. I don't, we've lost something. And so they literally took measuring tapes and went to porches and sidewalks and streets and took down every datum that they could about it in order to start thinking, why aren't we building like this anymore? Mm -hmm. And as that project continued, they started building places like that. And we started to discover the multiplicity of policy choices that we have inherited and which obstruct us from living in a more walkable place. One question that I constantly have at the forefront of my mind, having lived in a series of small towns that are particularly hurt by commuting culture and this kind of car-centric approach that we have to roads, is how do we help communities that become bedroom communities, communities that once had very strong, walkable areas, but now just due to the heavy flow of traffic, of individuals either in the town or on either side, you know, commuting to the city, be it D.C. or to the nearest capital, you know, somewhere out in the Midwest or wherever it might be. How do we help the people in those town continue to feel that they actually have a space that is their own? Because I think it's very easy, especially considering the way we cater to the car, for that community to just become no more than a highway for all the travelers getting to and from their very important city jobs. And I have talked to a lot of people who are very concerned about that impact, you know, especially on the families within such a place. I don't know if you've run mm -hmm. into that at all. Yes, absolutely. And one of, I think one of the best things that you can do is to fix, is fix your streets. A lot of roads have been re-engineered in order to try and get as many cars through the commute as possible. And there's good reason to do that when people need to travel. But that is the proper purpose of a highway, which doesn't go through any place, which just goes through empty fields. When you have a street or a road that is going through a human place, you need to design it as a humane space. And so that includes um, narrower lanes so that cars automatically go a little bit slower, pay attention a little bit more. It means that you have wider sidewalks so that people can walk down them and not be run off the road. <laughs> yes. And it means that you need to have an activated streetscape. And what that means is that your storefronts, your buildings need to engage the street and become a place. And when you have that, when you have it designed so that the street interacts with the storefront where people who are driving down or walking down interact with the people who are coming out of stores um, immediately, then it draws people together mm -hmm. and it creates that critical mass that community can then build upon. And so that's one of the reasons why, for all of the policy areas I work on, street design um, remains one of my uh, pet favorites because it frequently is the first. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the earlier today, actually, about the catechism and that question, what is the chief end of man, and reapplying it. What is the chief end of a street? And I think... So often in the last several decades, we've treated the chief end of the street as a place for a car instead of what I would argue it should be, which is to be to bring people together to foster community. And, and that, of course, includes the car, but it is not its end is not the car. And I think we need to change that around a little bit, perhaps. Yes, absolutely. And that's actually in keeping with our uh, good English common law traditions. One of the interesting things when you dive into the history here is that streets were recognized as a place where all sorts of things could be going on. People could be shopping, people could be selling, people could be um, walking or riding horses with carriages. But the common law tradition recognized that if you were bigger and faster and more dangerous, say like a... Um, cart carried by horses, you had the responsibility 
not to trample people. <laughs> and um, in the process of trying to accommodate the automobile, we inverted that so that now if you are an if you are a person, you have the responsibility not to be trampled by an automobile. Mm -hmm. um, you have the responsibility not to jaywalk. And so it presumes that the street is owned by the car rather than the street as any public space is owned by the citizen in whatever fashion they are using it. Good points. Now, um, changing subject slightly here, just because I really am excited to talk about this piece, I would love to talk about uh, a recent piece that you wrote for the Washington Post entitled, Kids Are Living With Their Parents Longer, It's a Good Thing, which of course is not the <laughs> assumption in today's society. Um, so why do you think this intergenerational mode of living in which a lot more millennials and, and young adults are living at home, why can that be actually beneficial and not just a bad thing? I think it is a good thing when people feel comfortable sharing and pulling resources in families. And that is, in fact, part of what families are for. Uh, the family is a natural institution with many goods and many ends, but among them is mutual self-support. And so what we have, the situation we have today is that we have a lot of housing wealth that is owned by older generations. And it is often designed for large families, but once the kids leave the nest, it is relatively empty, except for, of course, Thanksgiving and Christmas and the occasional uh, birthday or reunion. Right. Um, but we also have kids who are going to try and acquire housing for themselves at great cost, mm -hmm. especially in cities like Washington, D.C. or uh, New York or, you know, many. I mean, there is an affordable housing crisis in every county in America uh, of some form. And so the question is, how do people want to be spending their money? Should young people be spending it on rent? for a decade where they accumulate no equity, they build no savings, um, or should they be able to accumulate a nest egg, a financial platform from which they can then establish themselves independently? The fact that we think this is so strange and so weird is actually says something about how weird we are. Right. Well, and that's something you point out in your piece. This is rather new to have kind of generational segregation within the home. In generations past, it was incredibly common for young and old to live together, for grandparents to move mm -hmm. in. And yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, th and that is something that historians have sort of discovered and be are, have been able to um, recover and restore is that the multi generational living arrangement was often a norm um, and something that everybody would go through at some point in their life um, because people were relying on each other for family businesses or um, because they were going to be passing something on. Um, and so in the 50s, we had a very strange position where we had a whole bunch of people coming home from the war after the Depression and needed to house one huge cohort of families. And we built all of our policy arrangements and expectations around that. Um, and yet, that is not a normal generational pattern. The way of living prior to that anomaly, that World War anomaly, is much more common. And we are finding ourselves returning to it, which is that, um, you know, people marry in rolling patterns. They have lives that sometimes they are in uh, greater financial position. Sometimes they are in harder straits. And they are able to rely on family. But what's important to note, and I will note this to everybody who is uh, screaming into their speakers right now, is that <laughs> living with 
your family does not mean living as children. Right. You can relate to each other as adults. You know, parents can charge, you know, some uh, degree of rent if that helps. Mm -hmm. um, but what is really great is that we realize that as we grow up, we become adults as our parents are adults and we can engage with each other in that mature fashion rather than this idea of moving back into the house and just reverting into a 13 year old who just plays video games in the basement exactly yes. well and and that's something i've actually argued in the past if you're going to be in that sort of living arrangement and environment that means you should help with groceries it means mm -hmm. you should help with the landscaping or the mowing if you are so able you know there's all sorts of maintenance skills that you can learn. It should be a time almost of home apprenticeship in my mind mm. so that then you go into your own place with a set of skills that you were able to pick up. But I also think it's important for us to talk about the older generational aspect, that this isn't just something millennials should do, but that someday maybe millennials should be able to do for their parents. Once they get to an age where mm -hmm. they need a home to move into, I think that we should be much more open to multi-generational living with the old and caring for the old. I think I think it, the Amish do this actually as well. Yes, frequently. Um, and we see this is a, a very strong, there's a very strong demand for this. Um, the AARP has been one of the leading people advocating for housing forms that can accommodate it. And one of the things that I've written about is the importance of being able to build accessory units, because as great as it is to live together, <laughs> oftentimes families will um, appreciate a little bit of space Just and independence yeah. for yeah. <laughs> sanity, perhaps. And um, our zoning codes have mostly stamped that out. But a lot of people around the country are starting to figure that out and are trying to fix their codes so that you can actually build what was classically called the mother-in-law suite, you know, the granny flat. Um, we had a two dozen names for them because it was such an immersive part of American culture. Mm. Well, we will have to talk about that a little more after the break. You can follow Jonathan Coppage on Twitter at John Coppage. And we will be back with more right after this. I became the prince of a town Welcome back to the Federalist Radio Hour. I am your host, Gracie Olmsted, Associate Managing Editor for the Federalist. You can email us at radio at the .com. And we are talking today with Jonathan Coppage from the R Street Institute. Uh, and we were just discussing accessory dwelling units, uh, whether that be a basement apartment or some sort of separate dwelling, I believe, that you have within your home unit in your backyard. Now, why are so many neighborhoods and towns hostile to the idea of building a s extra space onto your corner lot or whatever your property may be? There are two basic reasons um, as practitioners have encountered when they've been trying to get these codes reformed. One is that people don't like things that are different. Um, and people have a lot of wealth tied up in their homes and don't want anything to interfere with that. Um, and the second is related, which is that people are often skeptical of renters especially in neighborhoods that are primarily single family owned. Um, they think that they have bought into a place where everybody has just the same level of wealth as and stability as them. But the benefit of um, accessory dwelling units, if only there were a standardized better phrase, is that they actually add that diversity and it's not just that you have strangers coming in. It's that you are able to accommodate your own children when your own children can't afford to live in your city anymore because it is a smaller space. It is, you know, maybe a, a cottage house behind the house. And even if they don't live in your town, they can live in someone else's accessory dwelling unit in the town they do move to. One of the great examples of this that I saw was when I was in Indianapolis and going to the 
uh, Heron High School, which is a magnificent arts magnet school there. And it's in an old neighborhood, lots of old Victorian homes, which has now come up and it's a very, you know, desirable neighborhood. And so the large homes are expensive. But because they're that old model, they all have carriage houses in the back. That's right. And so the carriage houses are very popular with the teachers at the high school. And so they can move in and live in the neighborhood of the school and afford it on a teacher's salary while still being near uh, the school and the parents. And it allows a more um, complex and cohesive neighborhood to come together. People from all different price points and stages of life rather than um, just people who occupy one housing model. Mm -hmm. Now, it does seem that there's some uh, newer trends as well within uh, kind of the economy we currently have where we have places like Uber and Airbnb pop up in which people worry that the carriage house will just become this constant moving of Airbnb visitors and that, you know, it'll overturn their neighborhood peace and become just another kind of hotel stop along the way in mm -hmm. in their city. So is that a concern that you think is legitimate or do you think that people kind of just need to accept that along with changes in our economy and, and in housing, we're going to have some of these probably Airbnb apartments as well <laughs> <laughs> next door? Well, um, it, it depends. For the vast majority of people, you don't need to worry about that. Um, it, it is only in a very few um super hot vacation markets where um, this really even comes into play uh, in terms of large Airbnb population or short-term rental population. The vast majority of folks don't need to worry about it. There's no evidence that this happens on a large scale. But even when it does, my question is, so what? Um, <laughs> right. it, this is actually one of the great advantages of the accessory dwelling unit is that people can build them uh, before they need them for family. And so a lot of people, when they are getting their houses or building their houses, will uh, seek to build one of these because they're expecting in uh, 10 or 20 years their parents will likely you know, move in with them or they want to have that flexibility. And being able to either rent it out to a long-term tenant, like one of the teachers at Harrison High School, or um, on Airbnb, if you are, um, you know, in a short-term situation, gives you that financial flexibility to make college loan payments, to be able mm -hmm. to, you know, get your family to be able to take that vacation. And it allows people to turn their um, housing wealth, which they have and is significant, but, you know, you're living in it, into something that is a short-term cash flow asset if they run into an emergency. Right. And that's something that I've encountered in a lot of places is where um, people who have hit hard times or suddenly lost their job or had an unexpected expense could take in borders to help pay the bills, which is, as a matter of fact, again, a very long American tradition of taking in short-term visitors into your house as a way to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because I think you've traveled to multiple places now uh, doing the work of an urbanist and a, and a researcher on these topics, and I think you see spaces probably a little bit differently because... You interact so much more with the way in which they're built, not just with what's built upon a place, but but the way in which it's all orchestrated and put together. What are some really interesting cities besides Indianapolis and its carriage houses that you've encountered in, in recent months? My favorite city is Detroit still. It is, and it is my favorite city for what is happening there. Hmm. Detroit went through as hard of a time as any city in America has and has spent times in which it was as dangerous as anywhere in the world. And it is still in a very dire position. But what is remarkable if you go to Detroit and you talk to the people there is how are the sh grassroots shoots that mm. are coming up amidst the devastation of people who move in 
and fix up a house and then fix up the next house. And maybe they get a little bit of a business going and they work with their neighbors. And you can see the American spirit of self-government and associational life just bursting forth out of literal ashes, um, which, as it turns out, is the Detroit City motto. Hmm. However, I have recently encountered Philadelphia. And so, like I say, I still believe Detroit is my favorite city, but Philadelphia may be the best city in America in terms of urban form. Really? It is absolutely remarkable. They didn't destroy all of their good stuff. (laughs) (laughs) And that actually is uh, something that is very significant when you're looking at good places is uh, did they not destroy what was good? Um, But they have beautiful buildings going back well before the revolution because this is one of uh, the iconic American cities. And they still have most of those buildings intact. And so great ornamentation. They have amazing parks. They have Independence Hall, which you can encounter. And um, City Hall, American history is wrapped up in it. But they also have very narrow uh, streets. And they have shops engaged. And so you can you know, hop from one shop to the other without fearing that you're going to be run over. <laughs> um, Philadelphia especially as it is affordable relative to Washington, D.C. or New York, is one of the most remarkable places you can go and just walk around all day. Hmm. That is very interesting and good to know because, and no offense to Philadelphians listening, I have always been told, I don't think this myself, but I've always been told when I've expressed interest in going to Philadelphia, they're like, oh, if you're going to make the drive, you might as well just go to Boston. <laughs> 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 Which I, I feel so bad even saying that because I, I think there is so much history there. But I think certain cities have built up a reputation, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for whatever reason and are much more coveted tourist places perhaps because of that. Right. And I would not recommend going to Philadelphia dressed in uh, the garb of an opposing sports team. (laughs) They have acquired a certain reputation and earned it uh, for being very attached to their place and very defensive of it. This Mm. is the town that booed and threw rocks at Santa Claus. (laughs) But For its urban form and its history, its um, city life, it is remarkable. Uh, Another place that is worth checking out now is Salt Lake City. Really? Um, They have a boom going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, They recovered very quickly from the recession and have been uh, adding jobs. And they have been in the process of trying to catch up their built environment, which was itself very unique because... Brigham Young laid it out so that they had these enormously wide roads so that a team of oxen could turn around in the street without doing an oxen three-point turn. Oh, my goodness. And so that is generally an urbanist no-no to have a street wide enough, as wide as a city block. But what that means is that they have great flexibility. And they have done some amazing things of filling that in with, you know, public spaces or filling that in with trees and bike lanes or filling that in with parking. And honestly, um, their blocks are likewise that big, but they're big enough now that you can cut them in half. You can run a little alley through them and build housing along that alley and it just becomes a normal city block. It sounds to me like a giant city, as you describe it, like everything is a hundred times larger than anywhere else, kind of like a Gulliver's Travels moment. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I will have to spend more time there as I'm from the Northwest and uh, definitely live close enough to Utah, or my family does anyways, to visit. One thing I've noticed in my Idaho community that's caused me some alarm in the past is that as new growth comes into the area... Instead of, as you said with Philadelphia, kind of reinventing and reinvigorating what we already have, the small downtown units, the beautiful walkable streets, a lot of urban planners create these dazzling new, very fad-oriented 
spaces that be they strip malls or suburban neighborhoods with all the latest amenities and and looks and in that sense everything then you have to drive to because instead of building onto what's already there you kind of drive to whatever's the new trend in the new space and people buy whichever suburban neighborhood has the newest homes with the newest fads but then of course 15 20 years down the road no one's going to that strip mall anymore no mm-hmm. one's buying you know homes in that suburban neighborhood anymore how do we how do we fix that so as conservative i i think it's very helpful and reassuring to know that there is a market answer to that um, and an explanation for it, which is that we dramatically subsidize that development. The infrastructure that goes into the ground to build out a new subdivision and new um, you know, dispersed housing is, in fact, extremely expensive. And we have cities pay for it by taking on large amounts of debt that the housing itself acts just can't support. And so what's important for any city to know is how important it is to have a strong core because it costs the same to run a block of pipe from, you know, downtown as it does out in the suburbs. But if you can put a lot more commercial value on that as you do in a traditional main street, you can get the surplus of tax base to be able to pay for the rest of the city. And so if we are able to fix our accounting and actually charge developers the appropriate cost for what it takes to build there, and if we are able to relax the rules in town so that people are given free reign to redevelop and intensify in place, and they aren't just driven out by swarms of regulations to build in green fields, then you have a system that should sustain and should reinvest in its core and slowly build out, as opposed to just uh, searching the subsidized exit wherever they can find it. Hmm. And that is a good point. I know that you have done some research into kind of the way that uh, be they zoning regulations or other forms of regulation kind of put this level of red tape around a downtown area and make it very hard for entrepreneurial businesses to move into places that would be perfect to kind of reinvigorate and bring new life into. So have you, where are some places in particular maybe you've run into these problems? So one of the really, so first zoning codes, uh, you will run into that frequently, um, Downtowns, which were built in this traditional style uh, and this sound fiscal style, will frequently be rezoned so that you couldn't even build them in the first place um, if they, say, burn down or anything like that. Um, But even what's interesting and what we've done some work digging up is that it starts at a much higher level as well, which is financing. And so in that post-war period that I was describing earlier in our conversation, the federal government got so involved in housing finance that the entire market bent itself around whatever the FHA would insure and whatever Freddie and Fannie would buy on the secondary market. And what they were focused on is single-family suburban homes. What they were not focused on and what they actively tried to avoid were these traditional main streets where you could live above a shop. And because of that, the financing, as the decades went on, dried up on Main Street. And anyone that wants to go in and build it now or just revitalize a Main Street that is there is going to have a tremendous difficulty accessing capital because the federal government has so skewed its, um, has so skewed the financial market against it. And so one of the things that we're working on is trying to help people see how they can fix that bias and make a level playing field so that uh, developers and um, people investing in a place can do what they need to do and build what they think the market will bear as opposed to what the federal subsidy will support. Fascinating. 
You can follow Jonathan Coppage on Twitter at John Coppage. And we will be back with more of the Federalist Radio Hour right after this. All of a sudden, now you're back again. I thought you were happy with whoever did you dream about me now and then. Welcome back to the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm your host, Gracie Olmsted, and we are here today with Jonathan Coppage, who is the visiting senior fellow with the R Street Institute. He researches urbanism and the built environment, and you can follow him on Twitter at John Coppage. Now, John, you wrote this piece for National Review earlier this year about how much cities need good investment. And I would like to quote pieces of it because I I just thought it was particularly good. (laughs) Um, So really quick, uh, you wrote the same citizens who grabbed the electoral megaphone to voice their displeasure in the November 2016 election must now begin to rebuild their own places. Those of us working in politics must help them and remove the obstacles we have long placed in their way. Thriving cities need to lift barriers to keep housing affordable. Struggling cities need to remove obstacles that make it hard for people to create value. And any federal infrastructure money would be better spent on maintenance and on undoing the mistakes of past urban renewal boondoggles, not on building new vanity projects in front of which politicians can cut ribbons and receive plaudits. If we have learned anything over the past several weeks, it should be that one policy will not suffice for a country containing both Silicon Valley and Youngstown, Ohio. There are, in fact, two types of cities in America now, each loved by its own, each with its own challenges, each demanding its own response. So one question I had for you is, what do we need to do, say, let's start with Youngstown, for post-industrial communities who are hard hit right now on both an economic and I think a social capital level um, to help rejuvenate the life that they have um, or what's left of it, depending on the place. And then why and how does that need to be so different from a place like San Francisco, say, or Washington, D.C. or Alexandria, Virginia? So um, one of the best people I know on this is actually the current city planner of Akron, Ohio. He's... um, And he has written about how the difference is what problems you have. In the rich cities, you have a supply problem. You have massive demand and not enough supply. And so you need to build, build, build to relieve that supply problem. And hopefully this is something that conservatives can understand. Because if we can understand anything, it should be supply-side problems. (laughs) True. Um, But... In places like Akron, in places like Youngstown, in more distressed cities, what you have is a demand-side problem because if you're going to invest in Akron, um, you could end up buying a house for $40,000, putting $100,000 of investments into it, and it would be worth $60,000. Um, and that math just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so you need more demand and you need more people coming in to raise the property values to the point where it pencils out to invest in them. And so one of the things that they've done in Akron is actually to pass a tax abate, a property tax abatement, so that, um, if you come in and you improve a property for 10 years, uh, they will not tax you on the improved value of the land. And so it helps you at the margins be able to more effectively invest and be able to catch up. And that positive positive chain effect can kick into place where people move into Akron and invest in such a place. And um, you get the benefits of concentration of investment. Um, so those are the, the sort of policies that can um, go into place. You know, likewise, city planners and zoning officials should be very flexible when working with someone who wants to invest in a place because 
that investment is extremely valuable. And so working your plans around the people who will actually come and who will actually build good things is the first is the starting point for any renewal because any renewal ultimately doesn't come from planners. It doesn't come from large anchor institutions or investors as much as they have poured in. It comes from people and it comes from people making relationships and investments and cooperating until all of a sudden you turn around and you have a community. Well said. Um, so one question I think that I had as I was preparing for our conversation is quite a simple one. I think Jane Jacobs has inspired a lot of people who are interested in urbanism and why some cities work well and why others do not. And um, I personally think that her work is becoming more relevant, not less, to more communities, not less. And I wonder if you agree and, and why you think she has been such a constant source of inspiration for many, I think, in the new urbanist circle as well as others. Jane Jacobs was a remarkable figure. She was the icon, the paragon of good urbanism, of uh, fighting the experts who were captains of industry um, and were given the full powers of the government. And she was a housewife. She was a journalist. She wrote for um, architecture magazines and assembled her neighbors to cry out in protest when the planners wanted to wreck their neighborhood. And one of the reasons why her work resonated at the time, and I think especially why it resonates now, is that its essential wisdom is anti-planner. Its essential wisdom is recognizing the wisdom of the local and the small. Um, Sandy Akeda, a professor up at up in New York, has frequently written about the intersections of Jane Jacobs' thought and that of Friedrich Hayek, because it is the recognition of local knowledge and local habits and traditions as what an economy or what a city are ultimately built out of. The planners, um, the government officials like to think that they're the ones who run a city, but in fact it is the citizens who are the city. And so uh, Jane Jacobs' work has been rediscovered and is perpetually uh, cherished because of this essential insight. You don't have to know New York. You don't have to know Philadelphia, and you don't have to know New York or Philadelphia of the 50s and 60s that she describes in her book to know the wisdom and the humane knowledge that she is tapping into and communicating. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the reasons I say that I think it's becoming more relevant, not less, is that in her book, she says several times, in, in specifically the death and life of um, great American cities, that there's principles here that cannot, in her mind, be applied to the small town or the suburb, she says, because people there know each other, because mm -hmm. there are relationships, because this is a system of supports and um, ideas that work on a street where there are constant strangers. Mm -hmm. However, if there's anything I've learned as of late in my travels and writings among small town communities, it's that a lot of these people do not know each other anymore. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the principles, in fact, do need to be similar, I think, especially as populations move more, as people move in and out of communities more, as we become more transient, not less. And of course, I believe the transience in itself is a problem. However, I think what Jane Jacobs wrote is something that could and should be applied to a lot of communities that are experiencing that sort of transition, perhaps, and, and alienation to even help draw people back together. That's a brilliant point. Um, well, thank you. And, and, and I don't know that I had uh, quite made that connection ever before I heard it made. Um, the, the increase of being strangers among ourselves is one of the great challenges of the American polity. Um, 
And it could very well be that Jane Jacobs' policy recommendations are more applicable to towns now than they were. Um, But even where they're not, it is her manner of investigating problems that is certainly applicable everywhere. Um, And that is why she will never be irrelevant, because she adapts a mode of interrogating human behavior, and humans are behaving everywhere. True. I do think that more journalists should read and study her work because we've lost, I think, kind of this art of boots on the ground journalism where you just hit the city street running and talk to people right where they're at and investigate spaces right where they're at instead of just Googling things. Mm -hmm. Um, That is an art that we definitely need to be relearning, I think, in a digital era. Certainly. um, One question, too, I have on this front in terms of the safety of the street, the community, um, rebuilding uh, social capital, Wendell Berry has often said that community started to die when the television moved into the living room and people moved off of their front porches and in to watch TV. Uh, Because, of course, in the evenings, they were no longer out drinking lemonade, watching the children play, talking to each other. They were inside. Are there ways on a design level even, that we can start to help invite people back out into the street? Because it seems a lot of this is is suggestive. It's creating spaces that people then want to fill. It's pulling them out, um, even if there are temptations to stay inside. So are there ways in which we can do that better than we are now? Certainly, and the front porch is one of them. Building Mm -hmm. a house to face and engage the street is a first step is the first step of reviving a pub, the public space. Um, and there are some fantastical ways in which we have violated that uh, over uh, the past decades. There's an interesting story of a Georgia town where the police department has um, urged the town to ban the building of what I believe they called Snoop Front houses. Um, I might have that exact term uh, wrong, but they are essentially where the garage took up the entire front and the front door was in a just a little recessed slit um, of the front of the house. And so what it meant is that no one was looking out onto the street Yeah, because there were no windows facing the front of the street even. It was just a garage door. And then when people were going to their door, it was in a slit where, you know, anyone could hide and surprise you and not be seen. And so this built environment is part of, uh, you know, having a public space that orients people towards it is not just part of good community foundation. It is that. It's part of public safety. Mm -hmm. And it's part of public safety because of how it strengthens community. Right. Because you feel a responsibility to the people you know. Um, And I think, too, one thing I've noticed in the neighborhoods I've grown up in, uh, I actually grew up on a very busy uh, highway in a small town, uh, once again, kind of bumping up against the car in its various forms. And we were still surrounded by neighbors. But, you know, my, my dad often wondered whether we were at more risk to crime because we were on this busy street and he asked a policeman once about that and he said oh no you if anything you are safer because you have so many eyes on your house and that did prove out to be true that of course i think it would have been better if it was a slightly less busy street (laughs) in terms of car traffic but that there were many eyes on our property on our house at all times and because the town itself was still small and the neighborhood was still close there was, in fact, a sense of responsibility that came with that, that you wanted to help others protect their property in addition to just caring for your own. That, I think, is kind of a small town attitude that perhaps uh, gets lost in cities. However, I think one thing Jane Jacobs points out is that it can still exist in city. Where it builds up and grows is in strong, well-connected 
small communities of maybe just a couple of blocks even, mm-hmm. it seems like. Yes, absolutely. The the connection the connection and the eyes on the street, uh, the concentration of people is uh, the fundamental health of a place. And the more you drive people apart and set them apart, the harder it will be for them to, uh, to help each other. And what is important to note is that the built environment, you know, as much as I enjoy writing about it and studying it is not the be all end all because human beings are not cogs in a machine where if you just set up the machine they'll whir away pleasantly good people can overcome bad building um and bad people can overwhelm good building but what a strong built environment does is that it conditions you well, and it gives you a safety net, in essence. It supports good citizenship, and it draws you away from habits of bad citizenship. And so good citizens can certainly live in a place that orients you away from each other. But if you get into a phase of life in which you are less excellent, or where you are more in need, um, a bad space will isolate you, mm-hmm. and a good space will orient your neighborhood to to look after you. One, I think, excellent example of this, perhaps, from personal experience is my grandfather recently moved further into the city after his wife passed away into a, a little suburb neighborhood, and... Um, I hear the most wonderful stories about what he's now doing in that neighborhood from both his neighbors and from his relatives. He's been out shoveling snow for every household before they're even awake, um, of course, because he's of farming (laughs) stock, and so he's usually up before anyone else. He's been fixing cars. He's been you know, stopping to get to know every single person on his street and uh, even giving them produce from his garden when he has it. And I wonder how much it's just having people like that in your community that helps then become the turning point for especially the young people, perhaps, who live in that neighborhood, who haven't encountered individuals with such rich community feeling, perhaps. I think you're right. It's not all about the houses or the streets, it's its also the people who live in them. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always wonderful to talk about this, and I know I have a million more questions, so we will have to do it again. But thank you for listening to this episode of the Federalist Radio Hour. We will be back tomorrow. Until then, be lovers of freedom and ever anxious for the fray. Para no let your head go